Children, you may be dismissed this morning. It is a good and great day to be in God's house. Thank you, Tracy Baldeo, our superior children's leader. And so we want to say thank you for, to her and for our entire children's ministry team. And uh, you're in luck today. It's a, it's a one-time special. Uh, you're able to pick your children up just before Christmas at the end of this year. So. <laughs> That's our blessing to you. <laughs> so my son Levi, as he's getting a little older, he came to me the other day and he asked me, he said, Dad, t tell me just what is it like to be married? I'm, I want to know what it's like to be married and that sort of thing. And I said, well, all right, son. I said, uh, leave me alone. <laughs> in a half an hour I went back to him and I said why are you ignoring me and that was just as funny but some of you didn't get it so. <laughs> uh, what I like to do is start with a one sentence sermon and uh, this what this does is if you're new to River Life Church it's, uh, it's a thought, it's a concept it's a little more than a title it's Something that I hope that you can grasp and take with you for the rest of the day and even for the rest of the week. And so that's this right here. Matter of fact, this is a sentence and a half sermon for you today. I want to skip to right that last, those last three words. That's a promise. Say right now, that's a promise. That's a promise. You're going to find out through our message today, God has promised you certain things. And when he promises, he delivers. Now I can say amen. We've already praised and worshiped the Lord, taken the offering, and we could have an altar call right now. I want you to believe in the depth of your being that when God promises you whatever it is that he's got promised to you, he will deliver. Amen. He loves you. Amen. Now we'll back up. God's love is deeper and wider. It burns hotter and longer than the Darbarza pit. How many of you have ever heard of the Darbarza pit? Raise your hand. Praise the Lord. That's right, my man Jeremiah has. That's right. Mm -hmm. yeah, one of our military veterans. Yeah, we love you and thank you, Jeremiah, for serving, by the way. Yeah. Amen. I'm sure he would not like to see the Darbarza pit for the rest of his entire life. God's love now listen close God's love is deeper wider and burns hotter and longer than the Darbaza pit in the late 60's there was a team of authorities that went to Turkmenistan Turkmenistan say that real fast with me 1, 2, 3, Turkmenistan Okay, Turkmenistan. It's located right there. You can see where that's located in Turkmenistan. The Darbaza pit was a location where an oil company provided some rigs, heavy equipment, a couple dump trucks, and a drilling rig to drink, dig for oil in the late 60s, early 70s. When they began to dig for oil, when they began to drill, they didn't hit oil. They hit a natural gas bubble mine. I'm not sure exactly what else to call it. It was a space inside the earth that was full of natural gas. Wives, how many of you have a husband that's full of natural gas? You know what I'm talking about. Well, you know what happens when you strike the natural gas. It comes out fast. Not only that, in the 1971, when this oil rig struck the natural gas, not only did methane gas start oozing out in large, large quantities, but the entire rig and dump truck sitting beside it fell 100 feet before it hit bottom. And at that, that pit began to grow quickly in a matter of minutes to a diameter of 226 feet all the way around. And then at that, gas began to pour out, the methane gas into the air. And the nearby towns were starting to breathe this. And so the authorities thought to themselves, the only thing we can do, the only thing that we can do is light the thing on fire. And they thought to themselves, first of all, I'm thinking to myself, I wish I would have been there. What an exciting day. 
And they thought to themselves, let's fire it up. <laughs> How many of you like when it's a good idea to go ahead and just torch something? <laughs> okay, 84% of you are with me. <laughs> they lit the thing up. They thought that the fire would last maybe a week or two. That's what they thought. From 1971 until now, and scientists and authorities have no clue how long this thing's going to keep burning, but it is still on fire to the tune of 1,800 degrees Fahrenheit every single minute of every single day since then. At a diameter, with a diameter of 226 feet all the way around and 100 feet to the bottom, this thing burns hot. I think God gives us such illustrations so that we can actually comprehend a little bit, say a little bit, a little bit about God's great love, his goodness, his kindness. Now, this is super cool trivia, and I hope you enjoy trivia because I'm all about it. This Darbaza pit and Turkmenistan is known as Hell's Gate. Now I got some super cool information that is much more than trivia. It is a promise from God Almighty to you this morning. In Matthew chapter 16, Jesus is looking around and he's asking the disciples, who is it that people say that I am? And the disciples said, well, some say you're the prophet Elijah. Others say, you're a lunatic. Others say, you're a liar. Others say, you're John the Baptist. Others say this, and others say that. And then Jesus looks right at one of his closest friends, the Apostle Peter. And Jesus says, Peter, who is it that you say that I am? And long before Christ ever died on the cross, Peter, with the unction of the Holy Spirit, said, you are the Messiah, the Christ, the King of the world, the Savior of my soul. And Jesus says, flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but the power from the Holy Spirit revealed this to you. Peter, you are yet a small rock. The word Peter in Hebrew means a small rock. And then Jesus says, you are Peter, but then Jesus refers to himself, but I'm a large Petra. I'm a large cliff side full of rock. Jesus says, but upon this rock, I will build my church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Amen. Do you know anything about the Greek and the Hebrew? The word ecclesia is what the term, is what we refer to as church. Church translates back, way back into ecclesia. Back then, the word ecclesia did not mean building. What it meant was something inside of you. It was a state of being. It was a state of mind. When Jesus said, I will build my church, he's not talking about bricks and mortar. He's talking about reaching right inside Jackson Ryan's gizzard and building a church for crying out loud. And even if the preacher is dull and boring, and you'll still love Jesus. Even if your trial is overwhelming, you will still love Jesus. Why? Because that's a promise. Amen. And God keeps his promises. Yeah. Matter of fact, my good friend, Miss Peyton Edmondson, is on our media today. Thank you, Miss Peyton, for helping us out. Show us that first scripture from Psalms chapter 36. Sister Bill. Your love, Lord, reaches to the heavens. Your faithfulness, say faithfulness. Amen. I'm looking at my man Dan Newman. He knows something about faithfulness because he had stage four cancer. And the short story is he doesn't have it anymore. Amen. He understands faithfulness. God is faithful to you and to me. Your love, Lord, reaches to the heavens. Remember last year I preached that message about the universe and breaking down all its... You, if you weren't here or if you don't remember, it's 93 billion light years from one end of the universe to the next. The Bible says your, Lord, your love, Lord, reaches to the heavens. That's a long ways. That's a little longer than the 226-foot Darbarza pit, don't you think? Your faithfulness 
to the skies. In one light year, this is just fun trivia, in one light year, one light year is worth six trillion miles. Last year, I tried to break down all those numbers and give us something that we could comprehend. And what, at the, at the end of the math lesson, the fact is, we still cannot comprehend how great God's love is for us. How much does he want to heal you, save you, help you, guide you, protect you, give to you? We don't even begin to comprehend how to understand his faithfulness. But that right there is a promise. Your love, Lord, reaches to the heavens. Your faithfulness to the skies. Say, that's a promise. That's a promise. That's a promise. I want you to think of something gigantic. Matter of fact, I want you to think of something gigantically hellacious right now. It's Sunday morning. I'm asking you to think of something. You know what? Most of you probably walked in here thinking of something gigantically hellacious. It's probably been weighing on you for weeks or maybe months, and I hope not. But I got good news for you today. God's love is deeper, greater, burns hotter than what the enemy can fathom up and throw at you. Amen. His love is longer. He is more intelligent than your enemy. His love means more. His love gives more. His love is brighter. His love is more comforting. His love is more sure. His love is more convincing. Peyton has another scripture for us in Psalm chapter 36, verse 7. How priceless is your unfailing love, O oh God. People take refuge in the shadow of your wings. Now look, God wants to bring you close. He wants you today, this morning, to feel the warmth of his touch on your physical body. Oh, that's a stretch for some people. But I'm here to tell you, I'm alive today because I desire to feel the touch of God Almighty on my body. I don't live my life. I'm not interested in living a life where there's not a God who doesn't take interest in my personal being. His unfailing love is priceless. You can't put a price on it. A million dollars, a trillion dollars. One time I did a message and we calculate up all the real estate in all the world and what it's worth. I forget what that number is. Take that number and multiply it by whatever other big number you got on your calculator and God's love is still even greater. Amen. Amen. Oh, and this Turk... Turkmenistan, Turkmenistan, Turkmenistan. I'm finally going to learn how to say it when the message is over Turkmenistan. Over Turkmenistan. In 1991, every home in Turkmenistan received, oh, get a load of this, free water, electricity, natural gas, and salt until 2017 and from 2017 on now they are portioning out and so they still receive large portions of these free entities I did the math and figured out that you were a homeowner in, in Turkmenistan from 91 to 2017 you saved between 150 and 200 thousand dollars you think to yourself that's that's, look, I'd like to have that kind of cash flow around my house. Amen, brother. Amen. But God's love is priceless. You can't even begin to wrap your mind around his love. You can't put a number on it. You don't, and I don't, understand the greatness, even the complexity of his wonderful love. Genesis chapter 15. Super cool story. Miss Payton, if you show us that first scripture, just so that we can see that right in our eyeballs for a while. Your love, Lord, reaches to the heavens. Your faithfulness to the skies. 
And I just want that scripture to be etched in your brain today. Now to Genesis 15. Abram was his name at the time. Of course, many of you know, later God changed his name to Abraham. But at this point, it's Abram. And God said, Abram, I want you to take two calves, some calves. I want you to cut them in half. And you and I are going to enter into an agreement. Now, there's a difference between a contract and a covenant. A contract is something like if you go to my man Bobby Baldeo, who works at Best Buy in Ocala, and when I want computer stuff or home appliances or things like that, I text Bobby. And if I go up and I see Bobby, and I sign on the dotted line that I'm going to purchase X number of something, we'll say a washing machine. And I walk out the door of his shop with that washing machine, I say, Bobby, I'm going to pay you 30 bucks a month until this thing's paid off. If I break that contract, Bobby's going to show up at my house with an ugly face on. He's going to take my washing machine and leave. That's breaking a contract. A covenant, the closest thing that we have in this culture to a covenant that I think we can grasp and understand is a marriage vow. <clears throat> because if you've been to most weddings, most of the time the bride and the groom say, I will love you until the day I what? Die. Die. Now, Kristen didn't exactly tell me all of that before we got in front of everybody in the whole church that day, I remember. I'm just kidding, loosen up a little bit. I knew it was still death do us part. You see, the difference between a contract and a covenant. A contract is, yeah, you might get your washing machine taken away. You break a covenant, somebody's got to die. Mm, let that settle for a minute. We don't have enough time, and I'd like to scratch the rest of my notes and talk about the death of marriages. And Valentine's Day is coming up, and you're going to get it with both barrels, so don't miss it. <laughs> you are welcome for the warning. <laughs> In the ancient days, when two people entered into a covenant with one another, they cut cows over, and the both of them walked through the middle of the cow bodies. It's a little bit grotesque, I understand. It's not the most pleasant thought and sight. But as those bodies were separated, and the blood was in between the bodies, the people making a covenant could have been for marriage, it could have been a land contract, it could have been a business arrangement. This was serious business. And the two individuals walked between the cut calves. They both got the same blood on their feet and probably on their clothes as they walked through the path. And that signified this. If one or the other of them broke this covenant, may it be done to them as it was to the calves. It's serious business. If you're a teenager in here and you're thinking about getting married for real, you need to think long and hard. <laughs> and I ain't kidding. You know what? I had, when I was a little kid, I once asked my mom, why do people get married? Because they just run off and get divorced. We're going to talk about Valentine's Day too. I can't get that off my brain. Now go with me to John chapter 18, verse 1. Look that up later. It's not on your screen. I want this to be etched in your brain right now. Psalm chapter 36, 5. Your love, Lord, reaches to the heavens. Your faithfulness to the skies. John chapter 18. Read the story after a while. Jesus had just served his disciples the Last Supper. They get up from supper. They walk from Jerusalem, the Bible says. 
Now, picture in your mind, if you can, the temple of God. It's a church. Say church. church. Stay with me. Church. There's a church in the corner of Jerusalem. Took up a large portion of this corner of Jerusalem. At the top of the temple, you would look down into the Kidron Valley. Now, the ancients used to slaughter goats, lambs, and cattle on the mercy seat at the church. All the blood and all the guts would be gathered into a basin at the bottom of these uh, uh, altars, mercy seat. And it would be funneled underground down to the Kidron Valley. The Kidron Valley starts there in Jerusalem and it travels 20 miles to the south at a drop of 3,900 feet by the time it gets to the other end, down well past Bethlehem, Bethany, all that. The Kidron Valley is a place that for centuries blood was dumped into. Blood was shed. You can go back and read some about the wars of the kings and all that. Some dead bones were thrown into the Kidron Valley. Now, picture with me, Jesus gets up from his Passover dinner. And John says, the Bible says, Jesus walked through the Kidron Valley to the Garden of Gethsemane. This is the Passover. Now listen, yesterday, in the storyline, yesterday... 250,000 animals were just slaughtered. And all the blood ran from those drains down into the Kidron Valley. So you know for a fact that at the bottom of the Kidron Valley, which was dry for about 60 to 70 percent of the season, it only filled up with water in the middle of winter. And it was not winter, it was springtime, Passover. You know there was blood at the bottom of the Kidron Valley. Here's how I love how intricate the Bible is. Go back real quick to God's covenant with Abraham when he asked Abraham to cut the calves and walk through the calves with him. But back up, Abraham never walked through the two cut calves. Only God did. It's a very unique covenant. God was telling Abraham, Abraham, when you screw up, I'm going to be there for you. And God said, and when I screw up, be it so to me as it is with these calves. How many of you know God has never screwed up? Amen. How many of you know God is the same yesterday, today, and forever? Yeah. How many of you know he keeps his word? How many of you know that he means it when he says, till death do us part? And he does not plan on dying. Matter of fact, I got some very good news for you. I'm not sure that you know this or not, but God is not dead. Amen. And as long as God lives, he's going to keep his promise with you. And then God looks right at Abraham and says, Abraham, you little dirt ball. Every time you mess up, I, myself, will give my life for you and your descendants. And look how scripture fulfills itself when Jesus gets up from that Passover dinner, walks down out of the city of Jerusalem, walks through that blood of those 250,000 animals that were shed the day before. <laughs> as an illustration, as an example of my God saying, I'm giving my life for you because I told you I would never break my covenant. <clears throat> Jesus goes to the Garden of Gethsemane, which I like to reckon in my brain, I like to uh, think of it as the real world. See, that Passover dinner was beautiful and sweet. Yeah, there was a little bit of friction there, if you know anything about the Passover dinner. We'll talk about that closer to Easter and all. But it was beautiful and sweet and kind of a nice time for the most part. They get up out of that candlelit dinner and they walk through the blood at the bottom of the Kidron Valley and then go to the Garden of Gethsemane where the real challenge starts. Tomorrow morning when the real challenge starts, 
I want you to know beyond a shadow of a doubt, God's got your back. His love is never failing. His love reaches to the skies. It's bigger, greater, deeper, burns hotter, burns longer than the Darvaza pit for you. God is not a liar. The Bible says he's not a liar, that he should change his mind. His love for you, his protection for you. You don't have to say it out loud, or I don't care if you do or not. Think about what it is that you need God for this morning. Strength, wisdom, zeal, energy, healing, salvation, faith, whatever it may be. You may have a broken bone in your body today. You may have a broken heart. And I'm not making any fun because I've suffered with depression myself. You may have a broken brain. And I'm telling you, God's love is greater than that enemy because my Jesus says the gates of all hell would not prevail against Amen. my love, protection, goodness, grace, and mercy for you, baby. Amen. Bring it, Jesus is saying. Matter of fact, I think Jesus sits in heaven most of the time tapping his fingers, waiting around, asking his Father God, we can we get this show on the road, baby? I'm ready to kick some devil butt. <laughs> He wants it. And the devil's in your face and you're a scared little chicken. Look at this scripture right here. Your love reaches to the heavens. Your faithfulness to the skies. He's faithful to you. He loves you. He doesn't lead you down dead end paths. He doesn't trick you. He doesn't lie to you. My wife told me, I remember this date. I wrote it down on my calendar. It's a big day in my life. It's kind of traumatic. December 12th, 2019, she pulled me into the kitchen. She said, I need to talk to you. This is very serious. I said, okay. She said, as of right now, you are on a spending freeze. I said, what? <laughs> spending freeze? <laughs> So on December the 31st, I'm driving through town, and my son and I, we kind of like fireworks. And we see the firework tent by the bingo hall. And I thought, yeah, I would like some fireworks for tonight. That'd be fun to let off at midnight. It's always a lot of fun. I said, Levi, you want some fireworks? And he said, yeah. So I texted Krista, because I remember December the 12th, that's etched in my brain. I said, Levi, Want some fireworks? <laughs> Do you think that's okay? <laughs> this isn't my first rodeo. It wasn't my first trip through Danella or any of that. <laughs> we go into the firework tent, and the lady starts showing us around. Ooh, our eyes are big. We're seeing the show. Oh, this is going to be awesome. We've seen these one fireworks, the Black Cats. They're, they're a pretty good name brand. And then right beside the Black Cats were this much cheaper brand, less than half the cost for these fireworks. And I said, man, tell me about these fireworks. She said, oh, they're just as good. I said, really? I said, my dad used to tell me, you get what you pay for, but, 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 this lady says they're just as good. And it's half the cost, so we're going to buy twice as many. Hallelujah. <laughs> so we go home. And the fireworks display starts. Before that, <laughs> Levi and I had discussion. Dad, now we have we have a, a screen around our porch now. And I said, now, that wasn't there in the years past, so we're going to have to take the fireworks out even further because we do not want to have an incident up by the new screen. <laughs> so we take the fireworks way out into the yard, safe distance. Krista signed off on it. It's all good. And the fireworks st show starts, and they are beautiful. I mean, they're, in our neighborhood, we kind of live down in a hole, and we live, there's trees around, and so it echoes. And it's super cool. You see the lights in the sky, hear the echo. It's a big time. Until the last box we lit off fell on its side and started shooting right at us. <laughs> <laughs> and in case you don't believe me, I've got video proof for you this morning. <laughs> Peyton, if you would cut all
twinkling of a moment, I saw lots of things flash before my eyes. <laughs> and I remembered next year or the 4th of July, I will buy the most expensive piece of firewood there is at the tip. Because I was led astray. Poor me. Thank God none of us were harmed. There was five or eight people up on the deck and the screen is still intact. I checked the screen and then I made sure nobody's bleeding their guts out. <laughs> in that order. <laughs> Isn't it crazy the things? Somebody told me they, they were, uh, they were in, in a car accident one time and they asked how their car was and then asked how their own child was. It's just amazing <laughs> what comes through that phrase. Worship team, would you please come? God's love is extraordinary. Peyton, if you would take us to that very last scripture and song, chapter 103, verse 2 to 5. I want to read this to you while our worship team comes. Praise the Lord. Oh, I love that song. I raise a hallelujah.